the people who are really good at doing this kind of systems work, home networking, I think they're probably going to be annoyed by this video. Don't wait for the conclusion on this to go scurrying down into the comments to go, well, actually, there's a better way to do this. I'm straight up telling you, this is one of the laziest and maybe one of the dumbest ways that I've found to improve the capabilities of my NAS, but it kind of plants a seed of some other home networking upgrades that might be more legit and could be more fun to explore. Short story incredibly long. I've got a cute little NAS. I bought my NAS to future-proof some of my home networking upgrades. It's a little three bay from Q app, but it had a built-in 10 gigabit data connection. I got a switch for it. I got a, a router that supports 10 gigabit, even put a NIC in my workstation. The main reason why I wanted that NOS was really just for work. I could store a whole bunch of work files, video files on that NOS, and I knew I was getting slightly faster throughput on a three bay NOS to get those video files played from remote storage into my workstation. I do all my work off of that NOS. But of course, when you've got a big bucket of hard drives connected to your router, it's fun to do some other things with it too. And one of those uh, fun things to do is to run a Plex server, like that cubby over my right shoulder here, the one where I always have the little stuffed dog in the frame. Got a whole collection of Blu-rays that I absolutely adore those films and TV shows. Like, I'm just done looking for movies and TV shows that I really like across streaming services. If I can, I'll just buy them, find a way to rip them, and then keep them saved on my own collection of drives. That way I can watch them any time I want, anywhere I want, and I don't have to go looking for them. That's a little spendy, but with prices climbing on streaming services, it's proving to be a fun way to revisit your favorite movies and TV shows. Well, that started creating a problem for my workflow, though. Getting my wife used to using Plex apps, and my daughter, here's a Plex app on my TV. The little NOS that I have is really good at multiple direct video streams. Without any kind of transfer or transcoding or anything like that, I can support multiple 4K outputs. Even while working on my beefy workstation trying to get video editing done, it really didn't seem to hold me back. But with a little more travel, and also trying to check in with some of our favorite shows and movies, my NOS doesn't have hardware transcoding. It's got a little ARM chip in there, and it peaks and it's just murked when Plex is sending out a signal to reduce the stream quality because of a mobile cell phone data connection. It's a poor experience for the viewer who's out and about and boy howdy is it a little unnerving seeing your tiny little box of hard drives just peak at 100% CPU use and temperatures internally start climbing. Network attached storage is such cool technology to start incorporating into your own home, making your own cloud. I mean, think about how much would it cost you to get 40 terabytes of cloud storage on another service or another provider like Google or Apple or Amazon or Microsoft. I don't know that they sell to consumers in 40 TB quantities, so we wanna do more with it. We wanna find other things that we can do with accessing that storage and sending out and sharing media. And really, I also still need to get my work done, so I want a separation of duties between input-output and then also transcoding and media. A lot of folks would be correct to recommend that I just got the wrong box for our needs. I should go and look at a different NAS, a different solution, pull the drives out of there, transfer that information, and move up to a more robust solution that can handle input-output and also has support for hardware transcoding. But then you'd be watching a video on the correct way to upgrade your home networking solutions. That's not what this video is. This is the laziest way to improve the capabilities of your network attached storage. So what I did instead, I've been working with a number of manufacturers making these cute little Nook style mini PCs. This is one of those solutions where I kind of got it in my head. I wonder if there's a way to point the storage on my NAS directly to a mini PC, and then I can use the mini PC to handle all of the media and entertainment. My workstation will be directly connected to the NAS for work, and then the NAS can communicate with another computer to handle all of the fun stuff. And I'm sure a number of you are gonna have legit solutions that would do this really, really well, but I'm not talking about the best solution. I'm talking about the laziest solution. So I took one of these bad boys, one of these little mini PCs. There are a ton of options that are gonna be similar to this, that are gonna resemble what I've got in my hand here. Specifically, this is the Geekom Mini Air 11. This is an 11th gen Intel Celeron. Pretty simple, straightforward system. I did a review on this channel and also a Geekom sent over one of their anniversary boxes. This video not sponsored by Geekom. This is just the PC that I felt would best 
support the solution that I'm looking for. Little Intel chip, Intel integrated graphics, uh, gigabit ethernet connection, but really beyond that, I'm just looking for a headless mini server to handle Plex. And I didn't want to get fancy, I wanted to stay lazy. So when you buy a system from one of these little mini PC outlets, they usually come with storage built in, RAM ready to go, and a copy of Windows 11 pre-installed on your SSD. 256 gigs of storage and 16 gigs of RAM? That's kind of overkill for running a Plex server. See what I mean? Immediately, some of you are already saying, well, you should be using Ubuntu or Linux or, you know, what about a Docker setup? Lazy. Pop this back out. I checked over all the components, just made sure everything was clean, looked like it was ready to go. One of the things that's really frustrating about trying to do this on a Celeron, boy, howdy, do your Windows updates take forever. Because Microsoft also does that fun little thing where you do a round of updates, then you go into the Microsoft Store, and then you do a round of app updates, then you reboot your system and you think, okay, well, I've updated everything and you go back and you check in your menu settings again and there are more updates to run. And I had to do that two or three times just to get this back up to speed from when I reviewed it several months ago. I finally got the machine all updated, ready to go. I installed the Plex server and, and that's where I just hit that one little minor stumbling block. I'm going through the network settings in Windows and I didn't think to map the network as a drive. So you have to tell Windows when you go to this folder that lives on another computer on your home network, you need it to have a drive number in your Windows File Explorer. So Plex couldn't see anything for a couple of minutes. It took me about, I don't know, longer than it should have. I wanna say it was like five or 10 minutes, kind of sort through all of the routing, assigned a, a drive letter. I picked the letter P for Plex. And then I started populating all of the individual menu settings for movies and music and photos and television shows. And that's another one. If you've got the collection of content that my family has been building up as I'm the digital nerd that likes to rip movies and keeps backups of all my favorite uh, CDs and music and, and our entire archive of family photos, it's gonna take a while for Plex to build that database. And I heard my NOS just, just going the entire time, all those drives were spinning up as it was uh, going through all of that content to build thumbnails and find the heads and tails of TV shows and the credits for movies. The actual nuts and bolts, like what you have to do as a user is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward, but I would still uh, sort of allow for roughly a whole day of doing everything that needs to happen sort of with software and updates and then also building databases. And you also just have to double check some of those Windows settings. Like I don't really care if this is running in its highest performance mode, it's a Celeron. But I also wanna make sure that it never falls into a complete deep sleep state. And that one was also another tricky one where there was a different setting for turning off the system, having it uh, go to sleep, and then also hibernating. So I had to look in two different areas just to make sure that the computer would never completely shut itself down. I kind of did that initial setup over the built-in Wi-Fi here. That's not going to be good enough for a dedicated Plex server. We want to use, I mean, it's only gigabit ethernet on the back of this, but that's still going to be plenty fine. Even for 4K Blu-ray, get the data to this box and then this is going to send out the information once that video has been transcoded to go over a mobile connection. And that's another tricky aspect of trying to do this in sort of a low cost, efficient home networking kind of environment. This is all gonna get cabled up and replugged next to my router, living on a little bookshelf in our main hallway. If something happens, or if I need to check in on the system, or if I need to run any additional updates, it's kind of a pain. You, you don't wanna have to pull it all out of its little enclosure and then move it to another office setting where I've got a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse ready to go. This is another situation where having one of the these lap docks is a huge perk. Now I've been showing off this kind of hardware. This is this is my next dock. I've been showing off this kind of hardware for phones and uh, smartphone desktop modes like Motorola Ready 4 or Samsung DeX. It looks like a laptop. It's got a touchscreen and a keyboard and a trackpad and ports along the sides and audio and connectors. But really all this is is a monitor uh, a keyboard and trackpad and a big battery. You plug a phone into it and then Moto Ready 4 turns this into sort of a functional laptop or you're walking around your servers and you just need to plug into one, it's two cables. You plug in a USB cable and an HDMI cable for the video, and then you can get into the system. You don't have to remove it from wherever you might have installed it. I've said it in numerous videos before, and it's worth repeating here. A portable monitor of some kind is one of the best accessories you can invest in because it can pair with almost anything in your family of gadgets. It can be an extra screen for a laptop. You can plug a 
Steam Deck into something like this and have a portable larger screen gaming monitor ready to go. You can use your phone with a desktop mode or when you're troubleshooting some uh, home networking situations, you don't have to remove the computer, you can just plug directly into a portable screen and control surface. But about two days after letting this thing just sort of run on its own, I've got exactly what I want. This is handling all of the multimedia heavy lifting, and even while this is pulling information from my NOS and transcoding it for a mobile Plex viewing, my NOS is not spiking very high for CPU utilization. The NOS is really good at sending information out to multiple points. I can watch numerous 4K video streams, but now my CPU utilization from the NOS, sending to this and sending a video to my workstation, is barely peaking above 10%. I've got gobs of headroom for other things to do with that big old box of drives. And there could be some concerns like, hey, why go with the Celeron? Why not go with something a little bit beefier? Because I really don't need a ton of heavy lifting to get one or two 4K transcoded streams out to mobile devices, especially with the prices that these things are coming in at. Some of the newer 12th generation Alder Lake systems are going to be even less expensive and even more powerful. Looking at the lazy solution, one of the other nice things about these lower power systems though, I'm looking at a headless server that's going to operate 24-7, 365. This thing idles at like 8 watts, and its maximum peak power draw is under 30 watts. It would only be contributing about $150 to our electricity bill looking at the horrific prices on Southern California power. It's a simple machine to get up and running. It was a simple machine to install. It can live almost anywhere. The fans are near silent and it barely sips power. So I don't think you need a lot if you're just looking at kind of expanding on some of the networking capabilities, especially the multimedia capabilities for something like your network attached storage. But I do have a beefier AMD system that I'm looking at maybe uh, switching over to. As I look at a proper Docker setup, I'm trying to create something that's going to be a bit more of a Google Photos replacement and a few other tasks that are going to require just a little bit more oomph than an 11th gen Celeron can deliver. But I wanted this to be dumb, simple, and this is about as close as I could find to off the shelf, buy it completely ready to go out of the box plug it into my network, and with only a few little software teething pains, get up and running and take some of the load off of my work setup for our big old box of hard drives. I wholly expect some people will comment on the right way or the correct way to get something like this done, but sometimes it's just fun to try and slum it with something lazy. So of course, I want to hear from you. You've got a big old bucket of storage and you've got a little brick of compute power what are some other fun things that you can do to expand on some of these capabilities? Maybe pull yourself away from some of the subscription and streaming services out there. And how far do you think you can push this experiment with low power components? Please drop some comments down below, help educate some other folks in these comments, have a good chat, and also a little fun at my expense doing it the lazy way. As always, folks, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been absolutely amazing. Those of you who are clicking on links in my descriptions, hitting my home site, somegadgetguy.com, or if you're joining the list of names, scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at somegadgetguy on basically every service, but these days I'm spending a bit more time on the Mastodons, a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the Twitters, and I will catch you all on the next video.